Hi there, and welcome to this edition of the Alaska Report. I'm Senator Lisa Murkowski. My guest this month is Charlie Hubner, who is the Chief of Paralympics for the United States Olympic Committee. Charlie has worked in his capacity as a Paralympics chief to provide a number of really extraordinary services for both our wounded warriors and many others with disabilities in Alaska and across the country. By working with numerous Alaskan businesses, private organizations, and partnering with the military, veterans groups, and, and Paralympics organizations, Charlie has helped create a network to provide sports and physical activities for physically disabled veterans and others across our state. Nations around the world gather every two years for the Olympics, whether they be in London, Vancouver, Beijing, and it recognizes the great achievements of our athletes. This was a, a cause that was championed by our very own Senator Ted Stevens. But for far too long, we have forgotten about the very extraordinary athletes who must overcome physical or visual disabilities to compete like the champions that they truly are. The United States Olympic Committee and Charlie are fully engaged in enhancing the availability of physical activity and sports programs for people with physical di disabilities at every level. But there's an emphasis on youth and injured members of our armed forces. And with over 40,000 injured members of our armed forces in the last decade, I think we all recognize that this is, this is very important. It is my pleasure to welcome to the Alaska Report, Charlie Hubner. Thank you for, for joining us here this afternoon and, and an opportunity to talk about some really incredible things going on uh, within our state, within our country, by some pretty incredible athletes. Yeah, thank you, Senator, and thank you, State of Alaska, because Alaska has been a pioneer. Um, and right side by side with the U.S. Olympic Committee in leading initiatives for persons with physical disabilities to, to participate in sport, whether that's elite sport at the Paralympic Games or something as simple as uh, being able to play with your family, friends, and yeah. ski with your buddies. Um, so thank you. Well, it, let's talk a little bit about what exactly um, is, is available to, to those persons uh, with disabilities. You know, in Alaska, uh, I'm a skier, so I see the great works of Challenge Alaska mm -hmm. out on the ski slopes. But, but take it up a notch and, and, and tell our viewers exactly what we're doing um, through, uh, through the efforts to provide for our Paralympians. Yeah, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee is a little bit unique. We're one of only four national Olympic committees in the world that manage both the Olympic and Paralympic program, with the Paralympic program being for athletes with physical disabilities. There's a great need in this country, and we see it every day. Um, there's a great need in this country for physical activity programs for persons with physical disabilities. In a lot of cases, it's not creating a new program. Mm -hmm. It's just providing the expertise to existing programs, schools, uh, YMCA's, parks and rec agencies, uh, disability organizations, just providing the expertise on how to integrate a person with a physical disability in the programming. Um, we're committed, the U.S. Olympic Committee and our member organizations, which are more than 50 different organizations like the National Recreation and Parks Association, as well as Paralympic Sport Clubs like Challenge Alaska. Mm -hmm. We're committed to working with uh, Congress, working with government agencies, working with the private sector to expand the availability of programming for people with physical disabilities. And there's two reasons. I mean, one, as the Olympic Committee, we have one part of our mission where we want to be the best in the world. Uh, Olympic and Paralympic, right. we want to send Americans to the Games. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. The median income of Olympians and Paralympians is less than $20,000. The majority of our athletes are doing this because they love their country and they want to be the best. So we're trying to identify support to help that component. The second part of our mission in the Paralympic space is, is arguably more important. Um, every day in communities uh, throughout Alaska or throughout the United States, somebody acquires a physical disability, whether it's a car accident or the 15-year-old young man I just talked to in, in South Dakota who had cancer and lost his leg in November. Mm. Um, his family's thinking about this young man surviving. What do you think Conrad's thinking about? He's thinking about basketball. Mm -hmm. um, or the more than 40,000, as you mentioned, 40,000 young men and women that have served their country that are coming home to communities all over America with a physical disability. Research shows that people that are physically active, and especially persons with physical disabilities that are physically active, have higher self-esteem, 
have lower secondary medical conditions, have lower stress levels, critical for especially those members of the armed forces that are returning home, but also have higher achievement levels in education and employment. Um, we see every day the power of sport, and I'll, I'll use one story, an Army Ranger, who five minutes after he lost his legs in a rocket-propelled pro grenade attack in Iraq, he screamed once, and within five minutes, he thought about one thing and one thing only. He wanted to know how he could run with his son now that he was hmm. missing two legs. That's what yep. we do. Yep. The power of sport uh, allows individuals with physical disabilities to rehab, but it also allows them to be a very active part of life on a daily basis. And, and there's some incredible programs. You mentioned Challenge Alaska. Mm -hmm. Within Alaska that are doing that, we just need to develop collectively more programs around this nation. One of the, uh, the opportunities that I have here in Washington, D.C. is to get out to, to Walter Reed, out to Bethesda, and visit with our wounded warriors um, who are, are, are coming back. You know, these, these are, for the most part, men, young men, that uh, are very physically fit, and, and now maybe they're a, a double amputee. I have never seen such determination mm -hmm. as I have seen when I'm with these, these, these soldiers primarily um, in, in the weight room, in the training room, in the rooms where they're getting their physical, ther doing their physical therapy and their focus in, in talking with them. It's, it's, it's like you said, I want to figure out how I'm going to learn to play basketball in a wheelchair because I love to shoot hoops. I want to figure out how I can, can work my new legs here because I want to be running again. And you know, when, you, when we think about sports as a motivating factor and the fact that, you know, for the most part, sports are pretty, pretty competitive, how, how we use that in the healing process, um, pretty remarkable what, well, what you were able to do mentally as well as physically. And I would argue, and uh, I'm a suit, <laughs> but I would argue the mental part, and not only for the individual with the physical disability, but for their family. Mm -hmm. you, you've met Navy Lieutenant Brad Snyder, who, oh. who lost his eyesight. Uh, a year later, he won medals in London, and that's the elite side of it. Yeah. But he swam at the Naval Academy, and he, he was good at it. And in his rehab, he was sitting there, he was totally blind, and not only he, but his family was wondering, well, what's this what young next? man gonna be able mm -hmm. to do? And through the US Olympic Committee, and because of your support, we were able to introduce Brad to swimming again, something he was good at. And he said, he just, I was with him last week, he said it gave him confidence, but he said arguably the person most impacted with his injury was his mother. It gave her confidence. He got in the yeah. pool and he swam. Yeah. He did something he does well. Yeah. And it gave Probably him confidence. Probably looked just the same as he had before, and there he was. And mentally, and as you mentioned, it, not just physically, but mentally, the trigger went off not only in, in his head, but w w in his family's, that, you know what? He's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Everything's going to be all right. And it's just the, the power of sport, being able to ski with your buddies in Alaska, yeah. or being able to go on the Saddler Challenge and, and, and bike. Um, or be with your family and be able to run with your kids. It's something as simple as that that really allows for a successful rehabilitation. And we're committed to making sure there's more programs in the United States. Uh, we're committed well, to You partner. were talking a little bit about, um, about how we can integrate this with, within the schools with our students with disabilities. Yeah, it, it really comes down to all of our coaches. There's a perception, uh, I believe, out there that everybody thinks, well, if you're going to coach a Paralympian, you need to know you know, you need, you need to be from a disability background. All of our coaches today uh, that are coaching our Paralympic teams, the majority of the coaches we work with came out of the Olympic world. Our cycling coach, when I hired him, our judo coach, when I hired him, he asked, he said, I don't know anything about blind judo. I told him, I'm not looking for a, a blind judo coach. I'm looking for a judo coach. Mm. Any good coach mm. is a good teacher. And whether it's a person with a physical disability or somebody like me who wasn't a very good athlete that just didn't jump high enough, mm -hmm. Any good coach is a good teacher, and, and what we're trying to do with the U.S. Olympic Committee and with partners all over the country is really through training and technical assistance and the sharing of best practices, um, change that perception and get more coaches that are in high schools involved in teaching um, people with physical disabilities how to participate in sport. To, to be a blind track and field athlete uh, at a high school in the United States, you don't, go, you don't need to go build a new track. You need a shoestring and a guide runner. And it's a mm. classmate that could stand right next to that blind runner, hold the shoestring with them, and run around the track with them. 
there's your coaching lesson. It's that simple. And what we're really trying to do is use our platform and our expertise to educate people around the country that um, that a lot of our athletes, it's really about teaching um, and getting kids with physical disabilities involved. You think about the peer process. You're 14 years old, you're blind or in a wheelchair. You're already kind of stand out. Mm -hmm. You're probably the only kid in that school that is blind or in a wheelchair. And you think about all the pressures of a 14 year old and the peer processes that go on there and then you add that to it. And when everybody goes out to PE, that blind kid is usually sitting in the classroom. So you're ostracized from that whole peer mm -hmm. process. Something as simple as being able to go out with your friends and out with your classmates yeah. Yeah. and participate in physical education or sport is huge. And that leads back to that higher achievement levels in education and employment. And we're committed to, to working with the Department of Education and schools all over the country to, in a very innovative way, provide that expertise and best practices. And <laughs> you mentioned Walter Reed. I mean, one of the things that I, I get to do is, is watch Paralympic ambassadors uh, go to schools. And, and go to uh, talk a little bit about the Paralympic ambassadors because I think this is something that Alaskans would be interested in in understanding just a, a little bit more about the roles that can be played there. That, you know, Alaskan Joe Tompkins. Um, I mean, he uh, who better to go in? He's in a wheelchair. Uh, he was injured. Um, was injured at a young age. Um, who better to go in and talk to a family? Mm -hmm. or go in and talk to that triple amputee Marine that was doing sit-ups at Walter mm -hmm. Reed mm -hmm. and to say, you know what, everything's going to be all right. Yeah. Then the yeah. Paralympic ambassadors that we deploy all over the country that have, uh, you know, either acquired physical disabilities uh, or served their country and became physically disabled and have gone through rehab, have transitioned and have jumped back into life, whether it's sport but also career, Brad, I was with him last week. He not only is competing in swimming, but he's also working on his career plan. And, and his goal is to be fully employed after he transitions out of the Navy. So when we talk about all the issues that you're dealing with here in Washington, you got a young man here who's going through it right now that wants to contribute and wants to be that ambassador to other young people that have become physically disabled. And I'd argue it's probably the most important thing we do is uh, allow ambassadors, um, and Brad is joining us next month at a, an event we do called the Warrior Games at the Olympic Training Center. And Brad's gonna spend a week with us, but more importantly, he's gonna spend a week with 260 injured service members that are where he was a year ago yeah. now, and he's gonna mentor them and be that ambassador to say, you know what, everything's gonna be okay. And you think about the year he had. Yeah. I mean, three medals in London, and uh, White House visit, got to present a flag to the President of the United States as uh, a member of Team USA. I mean, who better to talk to other people? These guys are so inspirational. You know, I had the opportunity to meet him when, when uh, we were uh, at the event recognizing Senator mm -hmm. uh, Stevens for his leadership in this. But I also had an opportunity to meet with Shirley Riley. Mm -hmm. Uh, born in, in Barrow, uh, from a Barrow, mm -hmm. Barrow family, they moved outside at an early age to provide for Shirley's medical needs, but you know, beautiful young mm -hmm. woman who has been in a wheelchair her full life. And, and as a competitor, mm -hmm. what inspiration she provides to so many. And I look at those as examples, those uh, Brad and, and, and people like Shirley and and think they their 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 energy uh, their motivation knows no bounds um, they may be moving in a different way than than uh, they had initially started out but they uh, they are without limit when it comes to to their capacity not only to 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 be making a difference for themselves but for others as well. So, what what you and uh, those who are involved um, with the uh, Paralympians, as as the chief here, uh, kind of taking command and making good things happen. I want to applaud and recognize you for that. But I, I I do think that this is this is an area where again we can we can look at individuals that have have done good things that um, through their living example provide hope and opportunity and motivation for, for so many that, that will follow. And, and again, what you're helping to make happen is, is, is just superb. So 
Well, I, Senator Yu I thank and you for Senator that. Stevens and, and the state he of Alaska was a leader there. have been leaders in this whole effort. So thank you for your continued leadership and support of our mission. Well, we will continue that. Uh, we'll look forward to great, great developments that you are, are pursuing there in, in Colorado Springs uh, as you work to, to uh, advance the center there for, for the training of our superb and phenomenal athletes. Well, we're excited about yeah. that. Thank you again for your thank leadership you. there. And thank you all for joining us on this edition of, of the Alaska Report. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.